some kind of um, more concrete concepts, and then I'll start to drill down into very specific things. I, I mentioned I'd show you how we did some Facebook ads. Providing this internet works good enough, I'll, I'll log in live and show you the back end of how systems work, how, how we, we look at things in the industry differently than you know, how you may think things work. Um, uh, so let's just start on, on the biggest level. Um, just, just to remind you, um, the, the Orchard is a big distributor. We have offices all around the world. We're the company that supplies iTunes, Amazon, and the rest with, with music from artists and labels. And we now account for something like 30% of all the music available in these stores comes through our company. We also set up marketing and promotion campaigns. Um, so we do a lot around that. Um, and in addition to that, I'm a visiting professor at London Met Metropolitan University. I um, guest lecture at lots of universities around, uh, well, around the world. Um, I sit on the BPI Council. Do you guys know what the BPI is? That's the, uh, <clears throat> the trade organization for uh, the record labels in the UK. So even though I speak with an American accent, I've lived in the UK for the last nine years. And so that, that's an organization with Universal, Sony, Warners, EMI, and me and a couple of other people sit around the council and they, they do those, those, you know, let's vote on should we sue people that, that, that steal our music and they go around the room, everyone says yes, and then I say no, but that, that's the BPI. Um, I advise startups and I manage a couple of acts. So, just to, to kind of put things in perspective, you know, um, looking at the big picture first before we zero in, you know, there was a time in the music industry where if you wrote an amazing song and paired that with an amazing performance um, and you add a bit of promotion, you could actually succeed in the music business. And, and by the way, this, this stuff really exists. Um, but th th this was the music industry. A great song, a great recording, and good promotion. It was never enough to just make a great song or a great recording. You know, Elvis needed more than just that. The Beatles needed more than just that. And, and what they needed were the outlets to get to the people that no matter how good the music was, if you didn't get on the radio back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it didn't matter. You could make the greatest recordings of all time, but if you weren't on radio, no one could hear it. So what people did in the industry back then was anything possible to get that song on the radio, period. If they had to edit it, if they had to move the chorus to the front, if you came to your record label and said, I made a 15-minute a, a amazing piece of music, they say, too fucking bad. Get it to three minutes, otherwise I can't get it on the radio. If I don't get it on the radio, nobody hears it, and you don't have a career. Um, when MTV came along, anything you did was to get a video on MTV, because then radio started playing what was on MTV. So if you could get on MTV, Radio One started playing you. So everything you did was to get that video on. So you, that was your mission, you know? And if you got onto MTV, you got into the charts, you got onto Top of the Pops, and your, your, your career is, is off to the races. Um, those days don't exist. MTV doesn't play music videos. Top of the Pops isn't on the air anymore. Um, it's a new world. So what are the record labels, what are the artists doing today? If your goal back then was get on MTV, get on radio, now it's all about collecting fans. You have to do everything in your power to build an audience because that's where the money is. That's where your future is, is building this audience. It doesn't, radio's not gonna play you unless you already have an audience and Radio doesn't even have the same impact that it once did. It kind of washes off of you. You have to do everything to build an audience because this is where the money is. And even the music business changed. 
Getting on the radio meant that you could go sell your single or your album, but nowadays, it's just not even enough money to be interesting. You can't sell enough of these little things to, to make a living. So you have to think of it very differently. Um, and now what we look at is something, a very sexy term we use called ARPU. Has anyone ever heard of this? Average revenue per user. Every other industry uses this. It's, it's what's the average spend for a customer. So if you're O2, you know what your average customer spends per month. And everything you do is to either increase that, um, that, that spend. So if the music industry thought like this, we could really transform how we, we act. So instead of making a product and looking for people to sell it to, the idea is to get an audience and then sell them not just a CD or a song, but more things so we get the average spend of the audience up rather than sell you something, move on to the next, sell you something, move on to the next, and so on and so on. That's kind of an endless game. It worked good in the days of, of big radio, but it doesn't work anymore. So I'm gonna, the, the point is I'm gonna go very quick through these concepts, particularly this one little section I spoke about last year, um, and then we're gonna get into the details. But I just want to cement this in your, in your heads. So the idea is, if, if you have a thousand fans, I know how much money you're going to make if you do it right. It's no longer a guess. It used to be, if I made some music, I don't know how much money I can make. I don't know how many people will buy it. I don't know whether radio will play it. I have no clue. But now, if I have a thousand fans, I know exactly how much money I can make. It's not a guessing game. It, it now becomes a predictive model. And, and it works something like this. If I have a 1,000 fans, I know that most of them, 50% of them, pay next to nothing. Don't even care about them. They spend you know, one pound or less per year on me. I care about that bottom part because I know that 2% that of my audience will spend something like 150 quid a year on me, if you're a band. We, so we look at it like this. If you have a thousand fans, you can make about 20 grand a year. I can tell you now you're not gonna make a hundred grand if you have a thousand fans. I've never seen an act sell more records than they have people following them on Facebook, for instance. You can't have a thousand fans on Facebook and think you're gonna sell a million records. It's, it, it works the other way around. If you have a million fans on Facebook, I can make a prediction about how many records you're gonna sell, but it doesn't go the other way. So what we do is then try and get what the ARPU is. So the average revenue per user is about $14, $14, sorry, the American side, it's hard to get out of me, is about 14 pounds a year. I'll make on average 14 pounds a year from my customers, and that if you look at the top 20%, which actually it's on the bottom of this, 20% of my audience makes me over 70% of my money. So it's, I'm not saying you ignore the other 80%, but you focus on the ones that make your money, that top 20%. And how do you do it? By creating bundled offerings. It's no longer the day of just selling a CD. If I have an audience of 1,000 people, right? I know that about 20 of them are going to spend some good money, so I want to create some offering to them that they're going to want to, to buy. So first, all I do is I create empty boxes and price points and figure out what I'm going to add into those boxes that a super fan is going to want to get, that 2% of the audience. And then I create something for the 3% and then the 7%. And, and this is the new model of the music business, how you get your audience first and then monetize them. And then it's not a guessing game. And what, what do you put in these boxes? Two things. First, anything that's limited edition or limited quantity. You know, that it could be, it could be you know, a limited edition seven inch, it could be a poster, something that is special 
and you're not going to mass produce it. And the idea is if I know the size of my audience, I know how many I'm going to produce. So if I have 1,000 people in the audience, I might only produce 20 of something. That's it. We're only going to make 20 of these. There'll never be more. And that, if your audience is 10,000, you might say, I'm going to make 200 of these, but no more. And so the idea is rather than continuing to produce until you've sold to everyone, the value is in holding back and saying, actually, we ran out and there'll never be any more. And the other thing you want to add is, is what I call experiential. That you got Wayne's World, you know, backstage passes. You know, people value, you know, those, those personal experiences. You know, I did, I did a, 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 a bundled package for one act last year. We called it our all access bundle. It was uh, our AAA bundle. And one of the things you got was you could come to Soundcheck and meet the band. And that, that was something people really valued. It was, it's the intangibles. You know, a CD is a commodity, and commodities go down in price. This was an intangible, an experience, a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Um, people value that a lot. So what we started to do was to actually graph this. Sorry. And what we found was the higher the cost of the bundle, the more money we made, the higher the profit margin. So, th so that AAA bundle, right? The idea for that AAA bundle was the user, the, the fan paid 99 pounds uh, a year. And for that, they got unlimited gigs for a year. Um, they got to come to Soundcheck, sign set list, a postcard from the road, and a laminate, right? So I looked at the costs of that. The cost of that was guest list, no cost. So free to enter the shows. Come to the sound check, no cost. Um, sign set list, no cost. Uh, postcard from the road, you know, 50p. And a laminate, 50p. So the whole cost of a bundle that was 99 pounds was one pound. So it was all profit margin to selling the highest price thing. And then what happened was we looked at the perceived value of it, which was the really interesting thing that we didn't see fans going on to their Facebook page going, oh my God, I just spent 79p and downloaded a track from iTunes. We, got, we actually got zero of those. But the more money they spent, the more happy they were. The happier they were, the, the more excited they got that they would post, yes, I got the, the AAA bundle. You know, I was in, there, were, there was only 100 of these and I got one. I can't wait to see the band. I see they're coming to my town, you know next month. So we had 100 people that we sold, well, actually it was 200 bundles, all 200 of them had posted and reposted their excitement and joy over getting it, and none of them could care less about paying for a song, which also had the smallest profit. So really what we're talking about is building up what Seth Godin, if you don't know Seth Godin, he has nothing to do with the music business, but everything to do with, with understanding audiences. He writes a blog, you should follow his blog, Seth Godin, and he writes great books, one of them called Tribes, which in our world we call communities. So you build a community of, of fans, and communities of fans um, always have two elements, this kind of behind the scenes look, and the ability for the fans to impact or influence some event. So think like, do you know Coney? Anyone following Coney 2012? Does anyone not know Coney? You should. So, so the idea was a, the biggest social media campaign a few weeks ago where they told people behind the scenes look about what's happening in, in Africa with this, this one rebel called Coney, Joseph Coney, and then they allowed the community to go spread the word and make him the most famous man on the planet. And so that's a good example of what a tribe is. In, in the music business, it's, it's a community of building your audience, giving them the kind of behind the scenes look, but allowing them to kind of help you too in building your career. Again, this is all this background as I'm gonna drill down. Um, so those are the two things that you have to have. If you don't have those, you don't have community. 
So having a Facebook page and just go, hey, we're playing uh, next week, that's not building a community. Buy our CD, that's not building a community. And that doesn't interest people. They want to be part of something. Um, and maybe the way to think about it is social currency. Has anyone heard of this phrase? Social currency. Um, there's another author, a guy named Scott Stratton, who wrote a, a book called Unmarketing, which is probably worth a, a read. It's a very simple little book. But he's a marketing guy. And the way he describes social currency is he compares it to, to um, real currency. So imagine you go into a bank and you open up a bank account this afternoon, and a week later you go back to the same bank and you go, great, I'd like to withdraw 10, 10 grand. And they go, well, you can't. You didn't put anything in the bank account. You have to put money in before you can withdraw. Well, this is the notion of social currency. So when you're acting and building your communities online, what are you doing to make the deposits? You can't just put up a Facebook page, a Twitter page, and start pushing stuff out in the world and then expect all of a sudden everyone's going to go buy your T-shirt, your albums, and come to your gigs. You have to start making deposits. What are you doing to help your audience? What are you, what are you doing for them before you're going to ask them to do something for you? And it takes a long time to build up social currency. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, and it starts with the most fundamental understanding of who your audience is. You know, the one thing about social media is it's all about me. My Facebook page is not there to sell your shit, nor is any of your fans. They use your stuff as musicians to express themselves. Your music, your photos, your gigs, people will repost it on their pages because it's an expression of who they are, right? If you understand this fundamental concept, then you can actually get things to go viral. This is, this is the idea. No one's gonna spread it to help you. You know, when people put up their, their profile at Facebook, they say, these are my favorite movies, my favorite books, my favorite TV shows, my favorite bands. They do that because that says something about who they are. So you as an artist, you need to understand your audience and say, why would they identify with me? And what can I give them that they may want to spread because it helps them show who they are to their friends? You following me? Okay. <coughs> I'm blowing through this really fast because I want to get into the, to the details. Um, so now we get into the, the notion and now we're going to get into the kind of the nitty gritty stuff. Um, building new fans. Because what, what I've been talking about so far is, is the assumption that you already have this audience. Um, that how you, how you lead them as a, as, a, as a tribe of people, how you create stuff that they might want to share, how you make money from them. But at the, at the beginning, you actually need to build an audience. So let me tell you how some people have done it. And, and, and they've been really effective at doing it through mind reading. Um, and, and if you can imagine that I knew what you were thinking. And the moment I knew what you were thinking, I could present you with something that, that matched what your, your thoughts were. You know, that, that's the power of, of mind reading. Um, you know, if you can think of the old world of marketing and promotion, it's all based on interruption. You're doing something, and now we're going to interrupt this program so we can show you an advert. You're driving down the motorway, and we want you to l stop looking at the, at, the, at the road and look up at a billboard. We want to interrupt whatever you're doing so we can present a message. But it would be much better is if the moment you're thinking of it, that's when I present you something that's relevant. And things that, that accomplish that are, are things like Google. You know, Google's a brilliant way. Whatever you're typing in that search, I know what you're thinking. If you, if you type in Adele, guess what you're thinking about? Adele. So, so this is the moment you want to catch people. 
And two people that did this really effectively, you know them? Everyone should know them. Lady Gaga and Kesha. Do you know Kesha? Less famous. Um, the idea with, with them <clears throat> is, because um, I, know, I know the guy that did both of their campaigns. So what, what they did first with Lady Gaga was a year before anyone heard of them, they built up the audience because they understood having an audience first was important. And again, she leads a community of people, a behind the scenes look, so she talks to her little monsters, tells them what she's doing, and actually has them go out and do things on her behalf. She knows how to lead a community, she gets it. It's not theoretical to her, it's what she does every day. But what they thought about first was, <clears throat> we have to break her some way, you can't just put a song on the radio, so what they did was they decided to hyper-target New York City. And so they, they thought, okay, we're just going to go Manhattan, and we're going to only target gay men. And they used Facebook, Google, and YouTube to target the gay community in New York City. And they knew because of who, who Lady Gaga is, you know, her, her, her whole thing about leading the community is, I'm one of you. I know what it's like to be ostracized and, and picked on. I'm one of you. So she, she spoke directly to the gay community, built an audience in New York, and from there they were able to spread it all across the states and then internationally. The first time any one of you probably ever saw, I think her first video was Poker Face, I guarantee you it had at least 10 million views. The idea was, they didn't take it to radio. They didn't put her out in big. They started her very small, online only, building the community one person at a time. And then when it got to critical mass, which was over a year later, they then took her to radio and out to the world that everyone else saw. So even Universal Records understood you have to start with the audience. With Kesha, they did a very similar thing. Um, she was on a track by Flo Rida, and it was a track called TikTok. No, a uh, track called, what was that song called? Her song was called TikTok, Right Round. And, and the idea was she was uncredited on the track. She was just singing on it. So what happened was a lot of people started Googling, you know, uh, Flo Rida, girl, singer, right? Because no one knew her name. So they knew what she was thinking that you knew what the, the person was thinking about. So the moment they started Googling Flo Rida, girl singer, an ad came up and the ad said, <clears throat> the girl from Flo Rida, click here for a free track. And when they did that, they started to amass an email list. So when it was time for Kesha to release, they didn't take it to radio, they only sent it out to an email list that they had and it went number one on iTunes. And from there, her career expanded. So even the biggest artists in the world aren't doing it the way that people used to do it. It's all about starting with the audience. Do you follow me? I mean, maybe you want it to go back to the way it used to be, but it doesn't exist anymore. It's not about you have a CD, you find a record company, they take it to a radio station, they play it, and then you're famous. Because even the majors don't work that way anymore. Those days are over. So now let me dig in and show you exactly how it's done. So <clears throat> this is one that I just did the last two weeks. And the plan was, let me just look at the time again. Okay, so the plan was we have an artist. We wanted to increase their email list, promote a new EP that was to set up an album that's coming in September, and we weren't going to use radio, press, or touring. So no radio, press, and no tour dates, and a budget of 5,000 US dollars. Because if you remember my screen at the beginning of the presentation with a good song, good recording, matched with promotion, you can't escape that. So people are always paying for song pluggers, PR firms, there's always money being spent in this business. Now what we're saying is, can we take the money that's spent and redirect it somewhere else? So we decided not to spend it on any of the traditional tools. We just wanted to spend $5,000 US, so like three grand. But I've done other campaigns 
for 300. So, you know, it doesn't matter what level you do it. So, the way we decided to use the, the 5,000 US was 100% on Facebook. And w what we did was, in Facebook, um, we, we targeted anyone that had already been a fan of that band, um, anyone that was fans of similar bands, and we, we targeted certain countries. And that's really simple campaign to set up. Even that's something that an unsigned artist could do on their own through Facebook. You could actually do that part on your own. And what we did was, um, so if it was a similar artist, we would say, if you like this one, check this one out get a free track. We ran probably 100 or 200 different ads. So we, would, we had four different photos we looked at. We had 10 or 12 different marketing messages we used. And then each one of those was tailored for who was the audience we were going after. Right? Does that make sense? So, and then we could see what worked best or, or didn't. Any questions to this part, up to this point? Does that make sense? Okay. So, so the idea is we were going to use that $5,000 to hyper-target people that were already interested in that band or interested in a very similar band because they were all in the same genre. Um, and this was the results. Um, so the campaign ran from uh, March 20th to April 3rd. So two week campaign, we spent 5,000 US dollars. Um, the first thing that you can see is that we had 36 million impressions. The cost of those impressions is zero. You don't pay to put up an ad, it's free. So that as people were logging in, you know on Facebook you look down the right hand side, you see two or three little things. So that's why we kept playing with the messages. What interests people? Which photo do they go to most? You know, think about how, how, how people work. And so free to serve up 36 million ads. Um, of those, we reached nearly 4 million people because people would see it more than once. And even though I'm a new media guy, um, there is something to be said for people to see the same thing over and over, even if they're not clicking on it. It does make an impression, which is why they call them impressions. Um, of those, 33,000 people clicked. And of those people that clicked, we made 10,769 connections. And what they mean by connection is, those are people that, that, that um, became a fan of their Facebook page, right? And the idea for the campaign was always give up an email address to get a free track. So the byproduct of this was we actually picked up another 10,000 names on Facebook, which we weren't even trying to do. That wasn't the goal of the campaign. The goal of the campaign was to pick up email addresses, but a nice bonus was, was 10,000 new Facebook names. The cost per click is point, or, or the click rate, sorry, CTR, the click-through rate, is 0 0.08. And in Facebook world and in ad world, that's, that's a pretty decent rate. Um, it goes down over time. So if you looked at the first week, it was a much higher click-through rate. But once people already clicked, you don't click a second time. So the click-through rate goes down a bit. Um, and of the people that clicked, 32% of them converted to a fan. So people click on an ad, but then you have to give up an email address. So only a third of the people were willing to do it, which is good because people willing to cross that hurdle are a real fan. You don't want people that go, oh, I'm not willing to do that. Good, because we don't, we don't really want you. This is about collecting real people. Um, and the cost per click was 13 cents US. And because a third of those convert, the actual cost per connection, or the cost to get a new fan, was 42 cents US. 
That's the cost to get a new fan. Remember back in my slides when I said the average fan is worth 13 quid a year? Well, if it costs you 30p to get somebody that's going to spend 13, makes sense, right? Trust me, all those mobile phone operators, all those car insurance, you know, uh, comparethemarket.com and all those, they would love to have conversion rates that look like this. What they end up spending to get a new customer is more than they'll make in the first year. And I'm saying the cost of getting a new customer is the moment you get them, you can make money. Just sell them a single download, you'd make more money. And, and instead of spending five grand US or 3,000 pounds to get some press or somebody to play you on six music, that I don't know what happened with it. Yeah, I guess we got played at, you know, 11.30 on Tuesday night. This, I know exactly when I spent my money, I know exactly what happened with it. I know exactly where it went and, and, and how effective it was. So, so this to me is, is step one. Step two is it's nice to have fans, but what I care about is customers because who cares if you have a million fans? You want to find out who actually buys your stuff. So <clears throat> what we then do is, remember I told you we collected all those emails. So we collected um, in the last 30 days. So new, it, who uses a, 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 an email program other than Hotmail or Gmail for their band? Use like MailChimp, things like that. So this is one of those programs. This is where you have to get more sophisticated about sending out emails. You know, you can think of, even if you send out an email every month, you know, by having something like this, what we look at is, what are the open rates? How many people actually read the email? What you'll see for a band is open rates as low as 20%, as high as maybe 35%. That means people that said, I want to be on your email list, I want to get your stuff, still 70 or 80% of them don't even read the email when it comes in. But when you have a more sophisticated system for managing your audience, what you can do is send an email, right? And then I want to see, okay, I want to look at the open rates, and because it's a, it's a, it's a more sophisticated program that any one of you can get, um, then I can say, you know what, send the email again, but just to those people that didn't open it. Because it's not spam, they never saw it in the first place. Maybe it got caught in their spam filter, maybe they were on holiday, whatever. And then you see another set of open rates at 20 or 30%, and all of a sudden, very quickly, you double the amount of people that read your emails just by being clever about it. Um, so what this does is I can look at the, the people we picked up from this ad campaign. It's blurry to you, but I can see it in the left-hand corner is 5,000-something. Oh, it's blurry to me, too. Um, and now what I can do is maybe I want to send an email right to them. Because if I know what the ARPU is, um, what we did with this band before we started the campaign is we created a bundle knowing that there'd be new people to the email list so they weren't on the email list the previous year, so they don't know some of the things the band was selling. So we created a bundled package or two bundled packages for new fans. And the idea is if we sell to just 50 of them, of the 5,000 new ones, we will have paid the $5,000 back that, that it cost to acquire them. So we close the loop. So we spend some money to get them, but with a notion that we're gonna sell them a very small percentage, one or two percent of them something, and we will make the money back from, from those people. And all of this is to set up for an album that comes in September. So this is kind of the new strategic thinking that we're all doing in the industry. It's not about, can you play a gig? Can you post something on Facebook? It's understanding your audience is better. You know, even if you, if you look at this column here, it's called an influencer score. So I can actually look at which people on my email list are more important because they're influencers, meaning 
They have um, a lot of people following them on social media. When they post something, people read it or forward it or share it. So I want to know who my best fans are, not because of, of how much money they spend, but what kind of influence they have out in the world. So I might want to do something just to my top influencers. So if you, if, if you focus on them and get them to spread some message and personalize something just for them, or <clears throat> I can do it by looking at who's already purchased something, because knowing who my best customers is very important too. So the idea is you have to link your sales with your list. Again, these are tools that are readily available to everybody. This used to be things that nobody could afford. Now they're most of these are free tools that you can use. So now I want to know who my best customers are because you know I flew up today on BA. They know I'm their best customer. So when I go to fly, because I, I'm in a different city um, every week of the year, so I travel all over the world, and they know that. So when I go there, there's actually a red carpet that leads right up to the desk for me. And there's a long queue for those other folks, right? Because they know me. This is the guy that spends all the fucking money. Um, so now you can know which of your fans spend all the money. What are you going to do special for them? Because today what they did special for me was they let me sit in the lounge instead of out with all the other folks. I had an exclusive lounge to sit in and had a free cup of coffee and, you know, and a free newspaper. So, you know, I spend tens of thousands a year and they give me a cup of coffee and a newspaper for free. Good exchange, but, but I really felt like I was treated really well, by the way. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. You don't have to spend a lot of money to treat people well. So maybe your best customers, you, you delight them, you give them something for free. You say, oh, hey, here's a song. We haven't released it yet. So those kinds of things. You following me so far? I'm going to try one last thing. Wait, how many minutes do I have? I have 10 minutes. Oh, I could try two things. But I'll just try one, um, which is to log into the Orchard's backend system. That's the easy part. The bad part is we're just on a a 3G network, so I have no idea how fast this is going to be. My guess is slow. But let me give this a shot. And... Da, da, da. Which one? I have an assistant. We do magic tricks next. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So, this is the Orchard system. So, if, if you're an artist or a record label distributed by us, this isn't a sales pitch for us. I'm just trying to explain how, how people think and work today. So, what you do is you kind of log into what's called your workstation, where you have so, some, some buttons across the top about your account and your catalog and lets you upload releases and do all the stuff you do and put in your promotional stuff. But what I want to focus on today is the analytics, okay? Analytics is different than accounting. So accounting means how much money did I make? How much money did I make at iTunes? How much money did I make at Spotify? What did I get per download? That's all really important stuff and nobody can live without it. But analytics is different. Analytics is what was my activity? What happened yesterday? How many downloads did I have yesterday? I don't care how much I was paid for them. I just need to know how many I had. So let me show you what, what we do, and we'll see how fast the connection is. I should have clicked it and then started talking. So, oh. So this is an account we, I logged into from a record label that we bought, so I can show you. It won't have accounting information in it, but what it'll show you is activity of the last 30 days. It says last month, but it means yesterday and back 30 days. So if I can see Lil John is my top artist, top release is Miami by Pitbull, and Get Low by uh, uh, Kings of Crunk is my top track. 
So if, you, so if you're an artist, you might have two or three albums, dozens of tracks. You know, you want to look in in a snapshot and see what's hot and what's not, right? But you can go even deeper. So <clears throat> Oop. let's see. This isn't my computer, so it's always a little different. So, so what did I, I said there? Let's go look at one of the releases, okay? So what did I say that was? Kings of Crunk. Kings of Crunk. There it is. And we click on Kings of Crunk. And now I can actually see what the activity was on any specific date. I don't really care how much money it made in this view. What I want to know is, oh, this was the date of the tour, of a gig, so there was a spike. You know, this, these are the things you want to start to understand. If you play a, a, a gig, do you sell more records because of it? And if so, do they happen the week before the show as people got ready, or you did an amazing job and the next day everyone's downloading stuff? You know, these are the kinds of things, you know, as an artist or a manager or a label, you would want to know. So we can look at, you know, YouTube, Spotify streams, iTunes downloads, any kind of feed that's coming in, we're going to look at, I'm going to talk and do this. So let's look at this Kings of Crunk. And so the idea is, <clears throat> instead, of, instead of kind of guessing what works and what doesn't work, you know, the idea that maybe um, you had a, a great review in a, in, a, in a newspaper or a magazine, well, does it impact your sales? Did it make a difference? Because you're, spe you're spending a lot of money on doing this or you're spending a lot of effort. You know, somebody says, oh, yeah, you were played on Six Music last night. Great. I want to look at my analytics. Does that make a difference? Or was what made a difference that, you know, I posted something on Facebook two days ago, and that's what did it. So we now live in a world of analytics where we, we want to know exactly what's happening. So what I did was I typed in, this is what's called a, a heat map, and it's based on iTunes sales, and I put in Kings of Crunk, because that's the album we're working off of, and what I can see here is, you know, I can put in any activity I want, you know, any date, or, you know, this is from January 9th, but I, going back three months, but I could put any date range. And now I want to look at things like, well, where is, where are my sales happening? So let's look. So there's 45 sales in the UK. Because it's not enough just to say we have sales. I want to know exactly where they are. And so now I just start clicking. And oh, instead of saying we have 45 sales, I'm just going to zoom in. Now I can see everywhere where somebody bought this album. Right? And we can just zoom in here. Let's see what we're going to get. Wait till, I, wait till I switch to street view. <laughs> so, so literally, I have the postcode. I know the street they're on. For every sale you have, we know exactly where the person is. There's no more guessing. There's no more, what's that? Yes, I am. Yeah, <laughs> secrets out. What we don't get is your name or your photo. Um, but, but I do know exactly where my audience is for this band. So based on understanding the analytics, this, I can, what, plan a tour? Realize where my fans actually are instead of guessing, instead of a gut feeling? I think I'd be big in Germany. Well, maybe, but do you mean Hamburg or Berlin? Or do you mean, you know, Munich? You know, where is your audience? Let's, let's exactly see where they are and what they're doing. And this is the new world we're in. It's no longer, 
I have some music. I'll give it to a radio station, which will play out to people. We have no idea who they are or where they are or whatever, and hope that magically I'll get a check in the mail, you know, six months later for something. Now it's real-time data. And you build your audience, you manage your audience, you see where they are, you see what's effective, you see, wow, I was doing a lot of promotion in Edinburgh and it paid off, or I was doing a lot of promotion in Edinburgh, but actually I see most of my sales are happening in Glasgow. You know, this is the new world we're in. The chances of an unknown act getting any kind of features in a download store like iTunes, how do I get on the main page, is pretty close to zero. Right? The reason I focused on analytics was not because I didn't hear your brief on how to do it, it's because I ignored you. <laughs> Be <laughs> because if you want to, to be successful in download stores and promote in, and when I say stores, I really mean anything, whether it's YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, or it's even a physical CD at a shop. I don't, I don't care. The first thing you need to do is build your audience Use the freely available tools to manage them. Get into distribution and start to look at your analytics. Because once you can start to understand how your audience is behaving, when they're doing things, what you do, how it impacts your audience. Because for some people, getting a Guardian review shoots up their sales. For other people, it has zero impact. So you need to understand what's happening. And once you can clearly build an audience and understand what they're doing, only then can you start to think about how you're going to promote inside those stores. Because iTunes doesn't want to hear, oh, you want me to put this on the main page because it's really good? Okay, so which, which one of these releases should I take off the main page? Oh, One Direction? Yeah, we'll just take that off and, and bury them and put you. you know. So you have to actually say, no, 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 wait a minute. I have an audience and I can demonstrate who they are, where they are, how big they are, what they've done in the past, and this is why I have a new release coming out and this is why it should be featured. They're very receptive to that. So we do it with lots of emerging artists. I can, uh, last year we started working with a girl here that we were distributing, because um, I saw her in the evening and then First, I was like, oh, I so want to manage her. But then she already had a manager. So I said, well, then I want to distribute her. And her name's Rachel Sermani, and I just love her. Um, but since then, she had nothing going on. We did a lot of these things to build her audience. We doubled her Facebook page over the last month in terms of the, the size of it, because we ran some ad campaigns. Based on that and some of the tour dates, we're now able to get lots of features at iTunes and the rest of the stores. But that was only after putting in the work to understand who her audience was and building them in the first place. The, the reality is, anything you're going to want to promote, whoever you're giving it to, they want to know why it's going to sell. Why, it's going to, why should they put it on their radio station? Why should they put it on the main page of iTunes? Why, why, why? This gives you the ammunition. And also, don't waste their time if, if you don't have it yet. Build it. This is, these are the tools that, that make a difference. Is that cool? Does that make sense to everyone? I don't mean to like, I hope I'm not, you know, like taking air out of your, but, but actually filling it up. Like, this is exciting. You actually can do things that, you know, the music industry 10 years ago at Universal Music could have only dreamed of having access to this kind of stuff. Now you, it's at your fingertips. The reason people took things to radio was because we had no idea who the audience was and we had no way of reaching them. That's why we gave it to Radio 1. Now, actually, we can reach them without Radio 1. Why would we use Radio 1? Because even when it's played on there, we don't know who the fuck's listening. Make sense? All right. So this is my info if you want to ever get a hold of me, email address. If you are here and you're going to email me so I can distinguish between spam and not just say, oh, I saw you speak at, you know, Y days or, you know, whatever. And then I'll read it and respond and listen. You know, if you have if you have um, music, send me uncompressed WAV files. You know, 50 meg files. Or I'm joking. Do not send me a send me a link and I'll you know whatever. Thank you very much. <laughs>